these knowledge society debates are really about democracy. My understanding is that in India today already about 80 to 90 percent of 10 year olds are handicapped, will be handicapped literates. And most of them a large proportion of them will be coming into our cities. And to think of knowledge society in the modern understanding of knowledge, I think these people will have a serious problem. I think therefore real concern then would be fair play in society for these people. There is a huge body of indigenously developed knowledge which just gets left out of this debate completely. I mean, we're assuming that a knowledge society is hanging on s and development, on science and technology development. It's not only. So when we say either inclusivity, the kind of things that uh, Dinesh just raised, as to who's going to be entitled and empowered with knowledge, the average 10-year-old is probably going to still have, coming out of a rural area, still have a body of knowledge that he or she has picked up organically from the background. In science, you look at a particular universe and you extract laws and therefore create knowledge about that universe. But the moment you restrict the universe and say that these things lie outside the pale of the system that I'm considering, therefore they're illegal. They are not part of the system, and I think that is what is happening all the time. Uh, essentially, what we call outliers in statistics, uh, there are so many outliers that you don't want to consider them anymore. But how to bring those outliers, and suddenly the, the nature of the system itself changes, and therefore perhaps the nature of knowledge itself will also change. What this is a story about is how the excluded possibilities are rendered not just illegal, but unacknowledged and even unimagined in politics of innovation. So as far as I see, there are three major lacunae with respect to thinking about how can energy innovation be uh, making some contribution to sustainable development. I think to my mind, the first one is the conversation really oversells innovation. It, it really is seen as the answer to everything. In fact, if you look at both the literature on sustainable development, or at least the patterns in the literature on sustainable development and climate change. Uh, in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s, the conversation was very much uh, talking about behavioral change and thinking about that as a way to maybe change our patterns of consumption, production and consumption. That conversation has pretty much been reduced, uh, has been reduced to a conversation about technological fixes. It really is about technology as being the way to solve problems. To the extent now people have now started talking about geoengineering, saying that we're not going to be able to re reduce greenhouse gases enough, and therefore we've got to start manipulating the planetary um, uh, climate systems using all kinds of uh, really uh, global experiments. So a summary of the key themes in this high-level political discourse in the European Union, which incidentally is explicitly codified in all sorts of very high-profile uh, governance documents. All innovation is good, all technology is good, all science is good. Scientific truths are value neutral. There is a difference between science and technology, which we must recognize. I think we should have uh, mentioned this straight away right in the beginning, because we talk to science and technology sometimes in the same breath. Scientific truths are value neutral. When I say water consists of two parts of hydrogen and one of oxygen, that's a value neutral statement. But uh, technology is not value neutral. The, there are many other differences between science and technology. You need large money, large amount of money for doing technology, very small amount of money for doing science. The motivations for science and technology are very different, and, and therefore we must recognize this difference. So we may we, we may condemn a technology, but to condemn science doesn't make sense. A technology can be time specific, can be place specific, but science is not. Science is universal. My account of science and technology wouldn't be very different from yours in my ideal of how science and technology should be. But I think if we actually look at the world of practice, then we find that we have been a vast minority. 
so that risk assessment as it's practiced as social and political authority in public worlds, as science, is not the same thing at all as the kind of science which you're talking about. Scientists who do research front state-of-the-art scientific research also practice as scientific advisors on risk assessment committees for governments. They know that the science which is being described and practiced in those committees is not the same as the science that you and I would like to see in the world. What came through today in many, which ran through the day was really the way that science and technology has been projected and is perceived, I think, also by large sections of the people, and that is that it is good. A part of that is, I think, or all of it is connected to the fact that it is now the commercialization of science and technology is very lucrative business. So the commercialization, even in countries and societies that need innovation of their kind, are actually abdicating the space to innovation of another kind which makes sense commercially rather than makes sense for welfare. And that is why you see the science is good thing, that, that song being played over and over again. And it was often argued that the, the modern large dam is uh, neutral and that it is uh, something that can be transferred to uh, any point uh, or, uh, of the river or the nation. And you would get a, a frictionless sort of, um, uh, a socially frictionless uh, outcome in terms of nation making. That is, you would end up benefiting everyone across uh, the board. Uh, the, large, the modern large dam experience in India uh, especially from the post 1950s and 1960s and 70s has been anything but frictionless and I think by the 1970s you are looking at a large number of protests primarily around the question of displacement and uh, subsequent to that in the 1980s you have a, uh, a very f carefully documented uh, 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 challenge about environmental degradation there is more than one kind of knowledge. Nearly all of the focus of attention of concerns, responses to those concerns as they're defined and understood, misunderstood I would say, it's nearly all around risk. Attitudes and concerns are assumed presumptively to be about risk only and risk as defined by science so that when deviations and dissent occurs in the public domain with respect to innovations, it's automatically assumed that those, those deviations and dissents and oppositions are themselves risk-based. So this presentation is about the institutions of agricultural knowledge and how, therefore, agricultural sciences and agricultural policy perceive or do not perceive risk, uncertainties, and ambiguities. Now, the, the case for risk that, that I will look at is the case of arsenic incidents. Now, this is a case of known risk, absolutely known, very definitely calcula calculable, but inability to take action. Now, there are certain rules or norms of agricultural knowledge and policy that do not allow these. So our scientists and policymakers are party to the crime of poisoning a part of our population. Now, but we did not really know that is the ambiguity part of it, the next story. We know that Indian cattle are taken care of by anti-inflammatory and analgesic drugs, the diclofenac family. In a country where 74% of our population, that is human population, is meat eating, we have a, a, a livestock policy that is bent on dairy production, on milk and dairy products. So we don't really worry about what happens to the meat or the quality of meat or what goes into, into, the, into the livestock population. So if there's a caste system that prevails within our, within our livestock policy.